Okay. All right, this is me. Um, Charles Gilby, some of you have, I've met on sites on the island before and you've probably seen me around. I used to work for HSE, about 21 years with HSE for my sins, about 10 or 11 of those as a principal construction inspector, some of it around this part of the world. Um, did a lot of enforcement, did a lot of helping people as well. Yeah. Um, but picked up a few things, I'm going to state some bleeding obvious stuff during this talk, but I'm going to try and show you the world from HSE's point of view, although I am no longer in HSE, so you don't need to lynch me. Okay. Um, I want to tell you about HSE's priorities, how the inspectors work, I want you to know how they think, because they're required to think in the same way actually, it's uh, unusual, and they, they actually promote that, they, they publish all of this on the web. What's appropriate enforcement, uh, what the legal tests are, I've not done too much on that, but if you want to ask me. Now, computers aren't my thing, all right? And the, uh, the other night I was happily dealing with this, actually last night I was happily dealing with this, and I got up to make a coffee and I came back and my computer said configuring. Anyone know what that means? Because I don't, but what it means is it takes out slides, um, so they're not there. So, small contractors, legislation, courts, inspectors, um, that's all bad news. But I would absolutely say at the bottom, harming your mates, your family, your friends and other people, that's where the real bad news is. Okay? Everything you hear people stand up and talk about is law and you know, all of this stuff about what you've got to do with bits of paper. The bottom line is it's that that matters. And I've never been on a construction site where I'm looking at a dead body, and I've done a few of those, where anybody apart from the inspectors and the police are worried about this. Yeah? Everybody else is totally distraught because they're looking at their friend, all right? All this comes in afterwards, but let's keep in mind that's what this is about. Okay, loads of legislation, yeah? Tons of it, okay? But HSE fundamentally can't enforce upon a contractor unless they visit sites, okay? This is stating the bleeding obvious, isn't it? You've got to have an inspector turn up. So I thought I'd talk about why would they, sh why would they actually come and see you? There's two reasons why HC inspectors visit. There's stuff called proactive visits, means there's no actual reason specifically, and then reactive. So proactive targeting. Why would HSE want to come and see a small contractor? All right, construction's historically dangerous. Small sites are more dangerous than big sites, statistically. Refurbs are more dangerous than new builds, statistically. Yeah, and health is killing and harming more people than safety. So what do you think they're going to come and look for? Which sites do you think they're going to target? Yeah, if I told you HSE tends, construction tends to go to small refurbishment sites and looks at health, would that be a surprise? Yeah, remember that health bit because no one talks about it. But HSE does, this year the plan, HSE's plan is health, health, health all over the place. Okay, they can visit you at any time. But the island's an unusual place, isn't it? It doesn't have a resident HSE inspector, so they have to come over. And the way they manage their work is reactive work, that's the accident investigations and prosecutions, dominate any inspector's life. They spend their life in court, they spend their life um, with coroners, they spend their life with the bereaved families and so on. And to maintain HSE's profile of proactive work, they've devised this thing called blitz which means you put a whole load of inspectors in one place at one time and you tell them they mustn't do any reactive work. They've just got to proactively visit. You've been subject to some of these. You have one this year, I think, uh, on the island. The thing is, on the Isle of Wight, that's about the only way you're going to get proactive visits because you haven't got a resident inspector. So you can send someone out on the mainland and he can have eight hours inspecting. On the island, he's only going to get, what, six tops? and they have targets to hit, they have, oh sorry, expectations, sorry, expectations to hit. Yeah, there's no such thing as a target in HSE. Okay, so reactively, following an accident, obviously the police tell HSE what's going on, you tell HSE through Riddle reports, we'll do report stuff through Riddle, don't we? We don't forget to, okay, it's good. Um, uh, the other one is complaints, yeah? You almost all have been subject to the neighbour complaint, yeah, the other contractor complaint, the person who didn't win the contract complaint, but genuine complaints as well. Okay. The other reason they visit, of course, is this is the accident side. What, what accidents does HSE um, 
decide to go to. HSE tries very, very hard and is very good at being consistent, proportionate and what they call transparent. They want people to understand how they operate. Morally, it's a very good idea. And to do that, they produce something called the uh, instant selection criteria, which sets out the types of accidents they will mandatorily investigate. And as a principal inspector, this was the sort of Bible as to what I would issue to my inspectors to go and see. That's published on the web. It's very blunt. If you break one leg, you probably won't get an inspector. If you break two legs, you will. It's very clear. There are certain categories. If you want to look at HC's website, you can look at the list. It exists. And they publish it deliberately. So we've now got ourselves an understanding of why HSE might show up, haven't we? Yeah? And we now know if we have an accident, we report it on RIDOR, we've got a good idea because we know the list of what accidents they'll come out to. So you're starting to be able to anticipate HSE. Yeah? But we can only predict them to some extent. So I thought I'd talk about what an HSE inspection is like. And this is going in some way contrary to what Danny is talking about because Danny's talking about compliance. HSE inspectors do this. They'll want to look at your site. They will not want to sit in the office and look at your paperwork. They will walk around the site. It's a bit awkward because I keep having to look at the board to remind myself. They will notice things. They will see things on every site. Every site. They will photograph them and they'll collect evidence. Can I tell you the one thing that as an inspector is the most important thing I will do on site? I'll judge all of the things I see, but as part of that I'm judging you and I'm judging my confidence in you. That's what they're judging. If they think you can manage this process and you are in control and you are controlling your risks, even if they see a poor standard that is then dealt with quickly, they will be happier than someone they don't have confidence in. And actually, I thought I'd throw a few things up. These sort of things you see, aren't they? Yeah, do you think they're gonna notice that? Yeah, we'll use that as an example in a minute. That's a guy down a reasonably deep trench unsupported. This, what will they ask you about that? Any idea? Back to health. How did you put those curb stones in? And if you don't have mechanical lifting, they're going to then come and look at the paperwork. They're going to come and look at more detail. Okay. Would they notice if anything of concern here? This is an upper floor window. Sorry it's so small, but outside's a scaffold. And on that scaffold, you can just see there a little hop up. There's only two guardrails. He needs the hop-up because that window goes way up there and he can't paint it without a hop-up. When he stood on the hop-up, the guardrails don't work. Okay, another guy. He's up here, actually. He stood on the windowsill of this building, yeah, painting the inside. Um, they'll notice this stuff. They're going to spot him. Yeah, he's a lovely bloke. I've had a chat with him. He's really nice. But they're going to spot him, aren't they? Yeah. And they're going to spot this small contractor. This is a, a waste handling site. They're putting in the, uh, the speed bumps to slow down articulated lorries. Waste sites, the biggest risk is pretty much being run over. So their way of doing it is to um, put, I think actually they had three cones, okay, and then kneel down in the road and fix these whilst it's a live site, whilst vehicles are coming around. The interesting point about this one is they aren't there when you're on site, but they are there when you're in the cabin on the CCTV. Yeah, HSE are looking from the moment you come in the door. Harris fencing not clipped. This is supposed to be a pedestrian disabled access across there to get into that building. You'll have a wheelchair on its back. So, I need to talk about how they think. HSE inspectors do know the standards. They will understand the risk and they will think about enforcement all the time. Is this a scenario I need to enforce? Believe it or not, HSE inspectors do enforce quite heavily. Hmm, enforcement, okay. So HSE has a unique selling point in government. Unlike a lot of agencies, they enforce, and they really do, yeah? But it's all based on risk. If you aren't creating risk, you will not get enforcement from HSE. But they have a model for enforcement. And this is the second thing they publish on the web. I'm not going to read all this, it wasn't really put up there for anything more than me to, to remind me to say something. But effectively, uh, the EMM, the Enforcement Management Model, sets out how an inspector thinks. And I'm going to really rush this, okay? But 
This is designed to capture the brain of an inspector. This is what my brain looked like two or three years ago. Okay. It's not very detailed, and it's only got three colours, four if you count black. OK, on this side, over here, you've got what was going on. And on this side, you've got what should be going on. Yeah? And let's use that chap down that trench. Okay. Everyone agree that if that trench were to collapse, he would suffer a serious personal injury, potentially die? Happy? Don't want to argue too much. And the likelihood of that, remote, possible or probable? Any votes? OK, we'll go with possible. I'm happy with that as well. And if he was doing it properly, he's in a trench with shoring or a trench box. Yeah. Still could possibly be seriously injured, but everyone agree that the chance is nil or negligible because it's properly supported. Yeah. <laughs> So let's do that little line. We've got possible and we've got nil negative. Do you see it hits red and you can't read it, but that's called an extreme risk gap. That starts HSE thinking enforcement, doesn't it? Yeah. Then what are the standards? How easy is it to comply with that? Is it clear in law that you're supposed to have shoring? Yeah, is it clear in guidance? Okay, I'm going to skip on. There's a defined standard. And there you go. This is HSE's enforcement expectation. It's called initial enforcement expectation because we've got a couple more checks. In here is our extreme risk gap. Again, sorry you can't see it. In here we have, hang on, defined improvement notice in there and this bit. Does that surprise anybody? Yeah? So because the risk is relatively large and the controls would reduce the risk to such a small amount, the risk gap is great. That puts you in line for prosecution. Look at the word consider, though. Okay, This is capturing HSE's brain. I've gone to the improvement example. This is on the web. You can look at it. I, want you to, I use this, though, because it's the improvement notice choice was the... Actually, I'll show you there. In here, oh, you can't see, but it says improvement notice. Okay, This is where they start to look at you as a business. This is about confidence. This is about whether you're the sort of business we need to enforce upon. We, they, need to enforce upon. Have you got relevant history? Are you known for putting people down trenches without shoring? Yeah, if you are, you go here and you drop down that line. Have you got re relevant previous enforcement? So if you've previously had a notice for this, you go that way. Are you doing it for economic uh, advantage? Yeah, would that surprise you? You go this way? Okay, what if actually someone was seriously hurt? You go that way. But if we get down here, what's your, your inspection history? If they are confident, you will go good. Yes? Are the general standards on the site? Good. You're on the left-hand side of the chart. I've deliberately left this bottom of the chart off. There are three lines dropping off the end. Anybody want to guess what... Oh, four, sorry. But anyone want to guess what's in this corner? Sure. Prosecute. <coughs> yeah? On this side, letter. Okay. But of course, the letter is relevant history for the next time we meet. You meet them, I should say. This is the HSE inspector brain. This is how they think. This is how they go. Does it surprise you that if you've been told before that you've got bald tyres on your car, the next time the policeman stops you, he might prosecute you? It's just simple stuff, really. There's another load of things they have to check effectively. Is it in the public interest? Are we protecting vulnerable people? But invariably, prosecution is deemed to be a good thing by HSE and a bad thing by those being prosecuted. Well, that's the point, isn't it? So if I sum up HSE's um, uh, enforcement policy without using the right words, it is we prosecute you so that everyone else sees it and changes the way they behave. Yeah, that's the purpose. So. Good publicity, telling the world that we're prosecuting somebody, that's what they want to do. Anyway, here's the regs, okay? And Danny quite rightly did all of these, you know, client duties, um, designer duties, all of that stuff, all right? What I want you to do, though, is leave that with Danny at the moment and look down here. General requirements for all construction sites. Safe places of construction work, good order and site security, stability of structures, don't let them fall over, demolition, dismantling. I'm not reading them, but the regs go on. Yeah? This, those of you who have been around for a few years with the old construction regs pre CDM, they were just put into the back of the CDM regs. This is controlling risk. Yeah? Excavations, uh, emergency routes, fire, lighting, all sorts of stuff, vehicles. That's where you control risk. Let's go back to the inspector. 
he or she walks on site. They do not walk into your office and ask you to demonstrate you've told your client that they've got certain duties and you've got a principal. To, they don't do that. They come on and they look for a man in a hole. They look for a bloke on a scaffold. They find this. Yeah? There's obviously more. There's worker heights, there's asbestos, there's cosh, there's noise, there's all the other things. <coughs> but let's be clear, HSE didn't write these regulations to create a bureaucratic uh, nightmare for you. They did it so that people know their jobs, and then they can discharge them. As principal contractors, this is your business. Yeah? There's more. I just got bored, but you can see I'm not great. I just cut and paste off the web. That's another one. I can't remember what that used to say. So, they look for risk. Yeah? If there is no risk, HSE inspectors are instructed to not spend time on your site. If you have a visit that lasts 15 minutes, they were very confident in you and they would not seek to come and see you again in the near future. Okay? Health. You remember I said about health? Everything's targeting health at the moment for HSE. I've just put a few asbestos noise, hand arm vibration. It's all the sort of more sinister things that creep up on you as you get a bit older and you find, you know, you can't hear anymore. That's why I speak quite loudly, probably, for that one. Okay, do you get it? It's that thing. Everyone seen this one, Health and Safety in Construction? Yeah, it's that. If you want HSE not to bother you, do that bit. Yeah, simple, simple, simple. Make your site safe. And the guidance is out there. Yeah, and manage the risk through the paperwork. I'm not suggesting you should not do the paperwork side of things, but it has to be a, a reason an end game is that your site will be safe, not in its own light. I quite like this one, so I just put it in occasionally. Okay. And maybe trouble ahead. You lot won't know the song, you're too young. Um, have I got time? I've got time for doing a little bit more. Um, okay. So this is where I'm going to try and frighten you a little bit about what if you don't do it and go back to that, that accident where there's the dead guy on the floor. And the only people who are talking about the law are not his colleagues, not his mates, not his family. They're the people who are there professionally to investigate. So they're the inspector, the police. Um, you sometimes find a coroner floating about, but hopefully not, because they tend to get in the way. Um, so let's talk about some consequences for getting things wrong. Has everyone heard of fee for intervention? Yeah? Prohibition notices, improvement notices, prosecution, and the one that no one ever really talks about, ability to trade, yeah? So let's go through them. Fee for intervention, 2012, I believe, the fees regs came in as a method for HSE to recoup some costs and place the burden of investigation and inspection upon duty holders who are not compliant. I can't remember, I'm gonna say I've never done it, but I can't remember a construction site I ever went on that was totally compliant. It's a grey zone. Yeah, there's the very, very bad and the very, very good, and the very, very good are still a shade of grey. It's very strange, but construction sites are very difficult things to manage, and you can always find something if you really look hard enough. Okay? Inspectors have expectations to generate certain revenue. And what you being careful on the words back there, expectations. Okay? And they do get measured on what they, they generate in fees. Um, it is not their primary purpose, decent enforcement is, let's be clear, but HSE is, as the rest of the public sector, under financial uh, problems, this is a way to assist them. They are looking for something called a material breach. Until these regulations came in, that was not a phrase I'd ever heard, material breach. What is a material breach? Apart from a tear in your trousers, it's a breach that is obvious or material to the inspector. Yeah. If an inspector finds a material breach during a visit, the clock starts running from the time he started. And the clock is being charged to whoever they end up levying the fee to, £124 an hour. It doesn't change if you are a multinational or if you're a two-man band. Yeah, £124 an hour, because it's not a fine, it's a fee. And if you've got an hour's inspection with perhaps an hour's administration and letter written to you, it's £250. And for some people that is significant, but for a lot of companies it isn't. But if you have 
an accident, the inspectors, especially a fatal accident, the inspectors are going to spend considerable time. A lot of fatal accidents, if they eventually end up in court, which most do, um, will run into two years before you get to court. And during that two year period, the inspector will spend significant time at an hour, uh, 124 pounds an hour. Okay. Additionally, if you've got anything technically awkward that's gone on, let's say, unfortunately, you've had a crane collapse or there's a technical failure with some shoring or something of that nature, the inspector will bring in technical support and the technical support will be charged out at one of two ways. If it's another inspector, £124 an hour, if it's someone like the Health and Safety Laboratory, um, they notoriously lay bills uh, in the tens of thousands. Okay. Um, the cost of a ma say major investigation, these aren't major, these are fairly simple investigations, can run into tens of thousands of pounds. Um, and for a lot of organisations, uh, because the bill comes out on a monthly basis during that period up to prosecution, um, you can find organisations struggling to stay in business, frankly. Um, and when this came in, I did wonder whether a lot of small contractors wouldn't ever be prosecuted because the company would fold before they ever got to court. Um, I'm not in HC, I have no evidence to suggest that's happening, but you can see the scenario. Um, you have no choice but to pay it. You can appeal these fees, but, but uh, the appeal process is uh, long convoluted and charged £124 an hour for the person you're writing to. Um, it's not been set up to be particularly friendly to appeals, I would suggest. So, just at the top of the web, on the ferry on the way over actually, isn't it good you can use the internet on the ferry? Um, FFI invoices are rising 40% in three years. HSE uh, does give average invoice charges. Uh, they're now running at about £715, the average invoice. Some will be a lot smaller, um, some will be a lot larger but the invoice is monthly. So if you have 715 pounds for 10 months, on average, do you see the, the scenario? Um, I have to say, whenever I see the figures, I'm always um, uh, surprised, maybe not surprised, but HSE rarely gives a figure for the average cost of an investigation. They'll give a figure for the average bill because the bill is cut into lots of small pieces. Okay, prosecution then. Sentencing Guidelines Council just released their new guidance for courts on levels of fines and they put them through the roof. Uh, there's long been the idea that health and safety breaches have been under uh, fined. Um, if you get manslaughter, obviously I'm going for worst case scenario, uh, seldom less than half a million pounds for corporate manslaughter. And there are, you know, even the bigger companies will shudder at that. I represent an organisation that's got over £50 million turnover, which places us in the large category. Should we um, have a fatality at work, a manslaughter fatality at work, I think from memory we're looking at a fine that, um, they're, I'm going to get this wrong, but I, I've got in my head the th starting point is £7 million for us. And it goes up threefold, fourfold from that. So the range, and I think it doesn't come below about four. So these are significant amounts of, of money. Um, and for most commercial organisations, this should, whether it is, but should be focusing their attention. That's the point of this, to focus people's attention. Um, the magistrates' courts have got massively extended fines now, and the likelihood is of jail sentences um, uh, increasing significantly. And this one's the one nobody talks about. I skip prohibition notices and improvement notices because I know you all know about those. But this is where they hurt. You know the client duty to appoint a competent contractor? You aware of that? And you know the guidance is how do you test competency? Well, one way you test competency is look how the contractor operated in the past. If the contractor operated in the past was picking up enforcement notices predominantly or prosecutions, oh, by the way, it's a matter of public knowledge, it's all on HC's website. I can go on and look at any of your organisations now and tell you what your enforcement history is. The likelihood is you're not going to win contracts because the client has to discharge their duties. Why would they appoint you when they could appoint somebody else who hasn't got a, a poor record? Yeah. 
Um, the ability to trade is very, very important. So, in summary, concentrate on the big risks. Yeah? HSE will expect you to manage the significant risks. There is no such thing as an absolutely safe place. Every site has got faults. The likelihood if you get an inspection is you will pick up, um, did I push it? No, I thought I pushed the button. You will pick up a fee for intervention because they will find a breach that is a material breach. It, it is not a, a breach in the terms of the notices. You know, there's a risk, but a material breach. <coughs> okay, so please control the real risks, the stuff that will really hurt people, because the stuff you can do is all about going home at the end of the day, is going to keep you out of the big end, that high level fines, that getting a bad history, stopping you from being able to trade. And also, frankly, I'll come back to the beginning, standing there and looking, out, looking over the body of someone you've worked with for 20 years. Yeah? And then having to make the phone call to the wife, husband, children. That's the worst of it. And that's really what I did. And in some ways, it's not about CDM. In some ways, it's about HSE. But it's about, you know, behaving properly. Okay? I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm not HSE, so you don't have to be nasty. <laughs> <coughs> can, I, can I come to easily fold and then release a lot of those responsibilities at the end? Uh, I'm not a time. corporate lawyer, but you do see it. Yeah, that's you do point. see it, yeah. Um, the difficulty there is HSE... No, sorry. The good thing there is HSE um, is very aware of the potential for that, so they will always look to um, the ability to prosecute individuals and individual directors and potentially strike individual directors off the uh, company's house list so you can't be a director again for a, a disqualified period. So it's quite, um, you're unlikely to find one of the big multinationals folding, but the smaller end, yeah, and they are aware of it. The very small end of the, uh, the world, sometimes it's debatable whether you lay the charges against the managing director and owner or against the company. And if they lay the charges against the company, I suggest you leave the company open. Because if you shut that company down fast, or they can get court orders to stop you, but if you shut that company down or extract the cash from that company, they'll just flip the charge over to the individual. Um, it's very simple. So it sounds like a great idea, you know. We've got it wrong, we're gonna get nicked, let's shut the company, yeah? Well, no, they just re-aim. Nice. Yeah. Can I ask, what, um, um, what's the effect on contract managers? Of? Managers rather than the boss directors. What's, what, what effect? Being if, if there's an accident and someone gets injured, and the contract manager is the one in charge of that side of the board, so Yeah. I, does he get involved in okay, the the, the the answer is maybe. Okay. Um, Section 7 of the Health and Safety Work Act puts a duty on every employee to look after their own health and safety and the health and safety of others. Um, if, uh, it's all about control when you're choosing who to prosecute. If you have control of something and you don't discharge your duty reasonably, you are likely to be prosecuted. And if a contract manager, for example, said to that chap in that trench, get down in there, which you know, is what the allegation was when I saw the bit of paper and saw the photos, if you've got an individual, I think it's a site manager actually, um, if that was the case and that guy is injured, you can see where the blame lies. Because the company will very quickly, in my experience, say, we have decent procedures, we instructed him, he, we trained him. That individual knew what he was doing, broke the law and put that bloke in the trench and he's dead. And then you end up in the individual, what's called gross negligence manslaughter. That someone took a decision that led to somebody's, the, somebody's death that was not, was so negligent it was gross. Yeah? Um, and the section seven is did you discharge your duty? Very often HSE seeks to prosecute the company because it sees ultimate control with the company. But um, very often the company sees responsibility with its employees and takes action internally to deal with, you know, poor practice. So it has a big effect on the individuals. Two things in. Um, quick win for any small contractor, as far as I'm concerned, when I go onto site. Um, 
is a tidy site, a well-organised site, a site that has um, evidence that there has been communication before work starts with regard to what the risks are for that day. Five minutes of safety in the morning is a quick win for small contractors with regard to managing risk on a daily basis. The paperwork has to be done because it's legislation. But if you want a quick win with regard to actually at the coalface managing it, tidy site, clean site, well organised site, and evidence that there has been communication with the guys doing the work with regard to what the risks are. Even if it's five minutes of safety written down in the site diary every morning as you have your coffee. Now, if an HSE inspector went onto a site, I would suggest that they see a clean, tidy, well organised site and there has been communication evidence in the site diary of what has been going on. There's a fair chance they'll go, well done, guys, thanks very much. Mm. See you later. First impressions do count, they really do. Um, yeah. In, uh, conversely to that, you go onto a site which is an absolute you know, chaotic mess and nobody seems to know what they're doing, nobody's wearing correct PPE, there's materials everywhere, there's um, unprotected excavations, there is uh, vehicles driving in and out without banksmen, those sort of things. The HSE inspector will sit there all day and just say thank you very much, you're now paying my Christmas bonus. I don't think they get a bonus. Well, not. Um, not on those terms, no. Well, they didn't when I was there, let's put it that way. But, yeah. Anything else? Charles, thank you very much for an extremely educational presentation, taking us to a viewpoint that is seldom, seldom seen.